I'm buried under two meters of snow, somewhere in the back country. If I can't get out of here in the next 10 minutes, then chances are I'm never going to escape. In what may be our final episode of Atomic Frontier, just how do you survive an avalanche? In order for us to properly understand how avalanches work, we first need to appreciate what they're made of. And what better way to do that than with a little bit of downhill skiing. Snow requires two things in order to form. Low temperatures and high humidity. Unfortunately, very cold air can't hold all that much moisture, which means that at times, it can literally be too cold to snow. Because of that, snow clouds will often form in regions where we have a mixing of both the warm, wet air as well as the cold, dry air. We get that around large lakes, in places where we have cold fronts, and also where we have mountains pushing up the warmer, wet air in order to mix with this cooler, dry stuff we have up here. With these ingredients and a bit of encouragement from atmospheric dust, a winter wonderland is sure to follow. Snow by itself is fine, but once it starts piling up, forming layers, we get some serious problems. To find out how this works, I'm going to need to do some digging. After nearly an hour of digging, with no help from the cameraman, I've made it to the bottom of a hole. From where we started, we've since descended about 1.3 meters. Along the way, we can notice various layers of snow culminating in the ground at the very bottom. As we descend, the snow changes in a few of its properties. Near the top, it's relatively soft. As we descend, it slowly becomes more and more firm, eventually becoming near impenetrable near the bottom. The reason for this is that while snowflakes fall as delicate flakes, they don't stay that way for very long. Soon, their arms get snapped off and cohesively bond with their neighbors in order to form a much more strongly packed structure. This process is known as sintering. The lower layers are more densely packed because there's just more pressure pushing down on them and more time for the sintering process to occur. One layer of snow which doesn't follow that trend is this one. It seems to be all flaky, just falling apart in my fingers. This is called depth thaw and is the reason why avalanches can be so devastating. It's caused by the difference in temperature between air pockets near the warm insulated ground and those near the much colder, exposed surface. Warm air holds more moisture than cooler air, and this extra water vapor rapidly diffuses upward. Along the way, rougher surfaces will preferentially accept the vapor, over time reforming our sintered snow into flat hexagonal crystals. If the local temperature gradient is big enough, then we're able to completely reverse the sintering process, forming an uncharacteristically weak layer of depth hole. Ski patrol will often dig holes, much like this one, taking temperature measurements in order to build a profile and work out where depth thaw is most likely to form. But this layer is often pretty deep, so why do we need to worry about it? To find out, and to allow me to warm up a bit, I'm going to go inside to give you a demonstration. Welcome to my custom-built avalanche simulator of doom otherwise known as whatever I could find in the kitchen. Our slope is going to be represented by a cutting board mounted onto a cardboard box. For our different types of snow, I've got powder snow as some flour, the depth hole as some sugar granules, and finally the sintered bonded snow is going to be a sheet of pastry. To keep with the baking theme, a gingerbread man is going to be our skier. Here's what our slope is meant to look like. A strong base of sintered snow, followed by a light sprinkling of powder. When our skier comes across it, they're pretty fine. Now let's see what happens when we add a layer of depth hoar onto our regular base, covering it with a layer of fresh powder, some sintered snow, and a little bit more fresh powder, giving it the outward appearance of a regular slope. This is a slab avalanche the least predictable and most deadly of all the avalanche types. The applied load causes the thin layer of sintered snow to break. The reason why depth hole is so dangerous is because it's this layer which allows the upper surface to slide down the slope, taking the skier along for the ride. 
We now know how they work, but how can we survive one? You're out skiing, and now Vuncher's coming right towards you. What now? Avalanches can travel at up to 120 kilometers per hour, so you can't outski it by going directly down the hill. According to the Prometheus school of running away from things, your best chance is to go at 90 degrees to the avalanche and try to get out of the way, perhaps the tree layer. However, if you've got a slab avalanche, then chances are you're already inside that churning mass of snow. About 25% of people who die during an avalanche do so due to injuries sustained by hitting trees and rocks along the way. To survive that, you need to wearing a helmet, a backpack, and hope that you just don't hit anything major. The remaining 75% of fatalities occur after the victim gets buried underneath the avalanche. Therefore, our next priority should be to ensure that we stay above the surface. We do that using one of these. It's called an airbag pack. It works by increasing your volume, reducing density so that you stay above the surface. They're actually extremely effective, even if they look a little bit ridiculous. A common misconception is that you can somehow dig yourself out of an avalanche, spitting to work out which way is up and then digging in that direction. However, this is a fundamental misunderstanding of what post-avalanche snow is like. The energetic events of an avalanche knock the corners of many of the snow crystals, which allow them to center back into a formation that is very much like ice. You can barely move your fingers in this sort of snow, let alone dig your way out. The only option is to hang tight and hope for rescue. In an ideal world, we'd then have a specialist rescue team come and get you. Ideally with a nice big dog, carrying warm drinks and a bit of cider. However, that's unlikely to get you in the time before you go into hypothermia and run out of oxygen. So the people who are actually going to rescue you are going to be the people you're skiing with. To help them out, we often carry one of these. Each skier has this transmission beacon in its transmission mode. If someone goes missing when they get into an avalanche, we then put it into receiver mode and it's able to detect signals being transmitted. In order to have a bit of fun, I've had my camera team bury a transmitter somewhere in this park, connected to some buried treasure. It's my job now to use just this receiver in order to find our missing loot. At this point, I'm pretty much as close as we're going to get by using the proximity sensor alone. The beeper is going a bit crazy. Now that we know we're in roughly the right area, I'm going to be using this slightly massive pole in order to jab it into the ground in a slowly increasing radius from where we think our object might be. Eventually, I think we hit something. Because time is of the essence, a shovel will really help us get to our trapped victim as quickly as possible. With a bit of digging. Yeah, I think we found something. A box of wheat bix, a true treasure. And inside is our beacon. The best way to survive an avalanche is to not get into one in the first place. But if you do, a bit of preparation and some very cool tech go a long way as does having a cameraman who actually remembers where he buried you. This has been James Stingley from the Atomic Frontier. Keep looking up. Okay, you can, you can dig me out now. Hello? Hello?